I'm also going to make a recording of this. So if you do not get this or have any questions later on, you can go back to that, which will send this out to you. I'll also enclose, as I did last time, I'll enclose some uh, attachments on some things from Kane Waters, uh, some things from Peter Diamantes, some things for uh, Bradley Bale and Donine, some things that I've gotten. So I can add it to your large pile of stuff that you've already gotten over the last few weeks because we've all been inundated. Uh, what I want to do is give an introduction to take us me about five minutes and then I'm going to introduce our participants. Uh, they'll each take about 10 minutes each to explain their topics. It'll be Dr. Zarich, who's Chief of Cardiology at Bridgeport Hospital, to give us an update on COVID. He's right there on the front lines. And Stu, thank you for taking time out of your busy day. He is head of triage right now at Bridgeport Hospital and he is the one that is making a lot of the decisions or helping to make a lot of decisions on what kind of treatment is, got, is, is given to various patients, various levels of the disease. So it's a, it's a new job for him uh, and has never had an opportunity like this or to meet these challenges. We also have uh, Gary Filan, uh, who is a well-known attorney. He's a labor attorney, uh, he's nationally known. Uh, he's on TV, he's uh, talking heads on TV. He's been on Good Morning America, CNN, among and other places. I'll introduce him in a few minutes. And then last but not least, my partner Ray Ma will be talking about loans and what we can do with the paycheck protection as well as idle. So a uh, lot's happened in the last week since we've been uh, online. You know, the pandemic is increasing. Uh, the death toll is increasing. The number of deaths in the United States is increasing. Uh, around the world, they're increasing. They're leveling off in some, some areas, and I'll let Stu talk about some of the details about that. But it's completely devastated the way we live our lives or challenged us or given us a lot of opportunities, depending upon how you look at it. I think we're near the apex, from what I, what I hear. Uh, we're close to the apex of this disease. Um, when I listen to people on TV, which I try not to do, I try mostly to read because it's sort of negative, it's a little bit depressing. Uh, and it sort of takes away a little bit of my chi. The feeling I get is that, you know, this next couple of weeks are gonna be one of the more difficult weeks, especially in this area, because we're sort of in the epicenter in the New York area in the Northeast. We're gonna be seeing a lot of, a lot of deaths. Um, some of us, some people we know. I mean, we have a lot of people in Bridgeport Hospital, a lot of people in Stanford Hospital, a lot of people in Danbury. Uh, and there's a lot of questions. You know, should we, we be, wear, should we wear masks when we go out? I actually put a mask on yesterday for the first time when I went to Whole Foods. I've never done that before. The CDC has been somewhat on the fence, and Stu's going to probably talk about that. But why were they on the fence? Is it because of there's the proper thing to do medically? We have, we have a president that says he's not going to wear a mask, or is it because we didn't have enough masks to go around? Online, you can look at plays like, how do you make a mask? How do you take a bandana and roll it? You know, Stu and I were talking about this earlier today. We saw a blog on a woman. She folded the mask and put it on. It's probably better than nothing. But what do we do with that? And Stu will address that. There's a lot of chaos right now in the stock market. It's very volatile. Uh, if you've ever seen a market go up and down, and have these kind of swings. It's, it's 5% swings, 10% swings. Uh, we don't know what's going on. Is it related to the disease or we're just so confused and we're just so, I mean, it's sort of like an angry teenager. It goes up and down. And um, right now, okay, chaos has been translated into the whole economy. We as dentists have been uniquely affected. You know, first of all, dealing with a life-threatening illness, perhaps. We're dealing with something that's completely shuttered our practices. Our income has gone close to zero for most of us. Almost few, very few of us are seeing any patients except for emergencies. In Seattle and the state of Washington, dentists are not allowed to see patients until May 17th, except for dire emergencies. So maybe, and it'll probably be longer. So the future is unknown. I went for a walk yesterday and I, and I broke the law. I walked in the woods. Uh, by Jeff Babushkin's and Stu Sarge's house. Can't walk in there. You, know, you get a $92 fine if you walk in the woods in Fairfield. Can't go to the beach. Um, I guess I, we walked on the road today. Stu and I took a walk today, prepared for this, and uh, we do a lot, and um, took, took police cars right by the beach. You know, God forbid we walk on the beach. I don't think we can get the virus by walking on the beach unless someone's coughing us right next to us. I can see making a law saying that we can't congregate, but to say that we can't go into public spaces. You know, this, I was in 200 acres of woods. I saw two people in an hour yesterday. That was dangerous. Doesn't make sense. But we can walk on the sidewalks. We can congregate in Whole Foods. We can go to gas stations. 
So the economy's take a hit, it's gonna take some time to recover, but again, there's gonna be opportunities there for a lot of us. And we can talk about some of those. I tend to be a little bit more positive about this than a lot of people because that's just the way my brain has been, tra is, has been designed to work. There's always a lot of opportunities when this, something happens. You know, even though people are laid off and people aren't coming to work and I have employees that don't wanna to come to work. One of my employees was supposed to be here to help me with this today. Um, spouse did not want him to come here. Want to leave the house. And the spouse happens to be in the medical field. They're that scared. So there's a lot of fear. And I talk about we have a virus of fear as well as a virus of a disease. So today we're gonna to discuss the status of COVID-19, what we can expect, what we can do as employers with our employees to ensure that the best strategies are employed for our team, because our team may or may not wanna come back. They may want to come back. You know, most of us have not taken one or two months off ever. I mean, I haven't taken two months off since, you know, since college times, uh, but not in the last 35 years. What are we going to do about business loans? A lot of confusion. I mean, I've been on a lot of blogs, as most of you have, and a lot of webinars. Most of us are talking about what kind of mask to wear, what kind of loan to get. Uh, those seem to be very important topics to dentists. So one of my mentors, Dan Sullivan, an entrepreneurial coach that I've been working with for about eight years, he says, the fastest way to change your circumstances is to become more useful. I cannot do anything about the virus. I can't do anything about the stock market. What I can do is something in my own body, with my own people, in my own life, people that I am surrounded with, my family, my friends, all of you are online a lot. I've heard from people I haven't heard from in 20 years. One of you was on this, on this call right now, sent me a beautiful letter uh, last week, which, which was very touching. People are reaching out. If I send a text to somebody, I'm not gonna hear back once. I'm gonna hear back with them until I stop texting. Everybody wants to connect with each other. So maybe that's one of the hidden gifts of all of this. And what's real important now is leadership. You know, we are leaders in our fields. We need to lead our teams. We need to lead our families. We need to be strong. We need to develop stronger relationships. And I think that's what the hidden lining, silver lining in this is. And we also need to be creative. So with that, I'm gonna introduce my first guest, uh, Stu Zarch. Uh, Stu Zarge is Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine, I believe I'm getting that right, Stu, uh, at Bridgeport Hospital, Yale New Haven Hospital. He's a professor at Yale New Haven. He's been there for over 30 years, I think, maybe 25 years. Uh, and he's also recently been appointed head of triage for COVID, uh, which means that he's making a lot of the decisions of uh, how the hospital should be run uh, during these times. Uh, it, is, it is something we have never seen before. We have never been united as an entire race, entire human race, all 7.5 billion of us are united against a common enemy. And that is what I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, the opportunities that we have now because we are united against this. We resourced a lot of, a lot of scientific minds, you know, maybe 100, 200 million people are now working on this together throughout the world. I mean, what does it normally take to get a, a vaccine? Five years, sometimes, 18 months? You know, we'll probably have a vaccine much sooner than that. We have a lot of people working on that. So I'm gonna introduce Stu first. Stu, take about 10 minutes just to give us an update of what you feel uh, is going on with COVID. You know more than anybody else on this phone call, I'm sure. And I look forward to hearing now what you have to say. Well, thank you again for joining us because I know you're really busy. Uh, no problem, Mike, thanks a lot. Well, I wanna echo Mike that, um, really as being leaders, I think we all have to really step up and look at this. So I wanna kind of frame this and put it into perspective so you guys can try to help allay some of the fears and I think um, uh, unrealistic uh, craziness that's going around. So if you look at the statistics of what's going on, there's still basically only about a third of a million cases in the United States are reported. So obviously there's multiples of that in the asymptomatic population. And the United States is actually still uh, under 10,000 deaths, so still way more than uh, Italy. Um, and overall, uh, worldwide, uh, basically, there's only about 1.3 million cases, okay? And with that, there's about 70,000 deaths. So that's a death rate of about a little bit over 5%. Uh, good news is the United States, the current death rate is 2.8%. Mm. So number one, it is not a death sentence. Obviously, it depends on your age and comorbidities. So if you're over 80, the mortality is up to 15%. But the old fogey age, great, uh, 
like us of in the 50s and the 60s, it's about one and a half to three and a half percent. But again, it's likely much less than that because we haven't uh, tested, we don't know really what the uh, denominator is. So it's not a death sentence. More likely, obviously, the biggest things not right now we're seeing is obesity and smoking. And uh, actually, interesting, men are about twice as uh, more likely to die than women. We don't really know um, why that is. But as you well know, we're testing a variety of uh, uh, meds, um, antivirals, antimalarials, and stuff that is going along here. So we're accumulating a lot of data. So number one, it's not a death sentence. The craziest thing in our situation is I think there is some hope. So hope today is uh, shown in the stock market. Mike uh, mentioned it's a good barometer. It's hope uh, over 1,000 points because the mortality rate in Italy and Spain is the lowest that it's been in two weeks. And cases in uh, Germany and France actually are the lowest uh, new cases in the last week. So again, they're ahead of us, but it shows you that I think we have flattened the curve. And I'll give you a good example of what we've seen locally. So eight days ago, I went back and looked at our numbers and we had uh, 76 COVID patients and about 11 in the ICU. And we have 147 and about 35%, I'm sorry, 35 um, in our ICU. So that's a doubling of about eight days, which is much less than the previous doubling about four days. So I think we are bending the curve a little bit, but it's a tripling in the ICU vented patients. And that's our problem. Uh, typically, if you go on a ventilator for routine sepsis or another problem like a bad pneumonia, you're intubated for about three or five days. These patients are intubated, the median is about 12 days. So um, the, half the patients are over two weeks. So that's why we're running out of ventilators. These are unprecedented numbers. So for instance, at a typical day at uh, Bridgeport, we might have 10 or 15 people on ventilators, 20 in flu season, and we've got nearly 35. So they keep staying on the ventilator. We don't liberate as many people. Mm -hmm. If you get on a ventilator, only about one out of four or one out of three are surviving because those are really, obviously, your really, really um, uh, severe cases, okay? But the reason why this is spread is because it's not SARS, it's not MERS, it's not Ebola. You know, SARS had about a 10% mortality. Uh, MERS, 25 to 35% in Ebola, as you well know, up to 90%. So it's the good news, and really, I can with the current guidelines, um, I think the CDC was late to the dance because the data isn't really strong. There weren't enough masks to go around, but it's clear that the one thing you're doing if you're wearing a mask, if you're an asymptomatic carrier, and you can be asymptomatic carrier for seven, 10, 14 days in, in occasion, you're actually decreasing the spread to anybody adjacent to you. So it's not a perfect um, a fit, but we really all should be doing it. You know, the, the social distancing, the hand washing is really, really working. For you guys and what it means to you in the office, I think it's uh, really important. Uh, Mike sent me the Washington State guidelines, and I think uh, the dentists are about as stupid as the doctors. So I don't agree with your current guidelines. So your current guidelines state that if um, the patient um, uh, doesn't fail your screen, no fever, no cough, uh, no problems with loss of smell, no sore throat, no headache, you're allowed to use your routine PPE. Well, the problem is, is too, too many asymptomatic carriers. And even if you're tested, the current, te the, uh, current test has about a 30% false negative rate. So in a way, it doesn't make sense to even test them right now. You have to assume that if you are having an emergency case, that that patient is COVID positive. And for those, I would highly recommend, since you guys are in the oral cavity, you know it's, it spreads by respiratory droplets, you guys should be wearing an N95 mask. You can cover that with a routine surgical mask and you guys should definitely have a shield and then you're safe, okay? And in fact, one step further and I thought for maybe even for marketing stuff, um, you could also in your offices for now and for future rooms, you can convert one room to like a COVID room that's negative pressure. Uh, I'll, can, I'll get back to Mike about it, but I think for about two to $3,000, very quickly, they can turn one of your operatoriums into negative pressure. I'm sure most of you guys don't have it. So that would keep uh, the virus and everything from entering the rest of your office in the area. Might be something to think about long term, and I think people would feel uh, more comfortable. What does it mean to you about what Mike said about when we're going to come back? So we do some sophisticated modeling at Yale. 
We're expected in Bridgeport to peak about April uh, 18th, somewhere around there. So we're probably about a week maybe behind uh, New York City as the epicenter. So, um, and triage means that we're gonna have to make some decisions if we run out of ventilators, who we might have to liberate for a ventilator, who we may not uh, um, basically put on a ventilator. And now for a special emergencies, um, we may be telling people that we're not going to do uh, resuscitation despite their requests in certain situations. So we know that if someone arrests on a vent uh, with uh, COVID, the mortality rate is essentially 100%. And because everything's aerosolized and everything is the highest risk to the staff. So those patients, actually, we are not going to do um, a, a, a cardiac arrest uh, resuscitation. And this is pretty, this is becoming standard across the country. Boston enact, um, enacted this last week, and we're trying to get the governor, who's yet not done it for us, to basically let the public know that this is a, a potential coming down. And the most horrible thing is you can't do this in person. As you all know, the family's not allowed unless it's very, very end of life in the hospital. And all this stuff has to be done with a phone call, which is just horrible. It's almost like we're in a third world country right now for these things. So the issue for us is evented patients because they, they stay in the hospital for so long. And then we can't get them out of the hospital because no one will take them. So the nursing homes are not taking them. You might have read, uh, it's stalled, but uh, Governor Lamont wants to make some nursing homes COVID and some not. So there's apparently a large arena with the state working together in Danbury that's being built as a medical facility, like in uh, Javits Center, so we can house recently recovering COVID patients who have no place else to go because the family doesn't want them, because we're not sure exactly when and how long uh, they're going to be uh, positive for and able to spread the virus. And locally, we're looking at the Webster Arena with uh, 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 Mayor Ganim and, and some other folks. For you guys, the number one thought is, you know, when are you going to be able to open? And I, you know, I'm trying to do a little math for you. Looking at us, there's really been a three to four week surge by the time we get to uh, April 18th. So I think another month on the backside is when hopefully the descending limb of these curves is gonna be happening, which is pretty close to what uh, Mike was saying about uh, mid-May as a guesstimate for uh, Washington State. But again, remember Washington State is actually um, ahead of us. For instance, they actually just sent, Washington State is sending 400 ventilators to New York City today that they don't need anymore. So I would say probably late May, early June, and then you're gonna have a, a real uh, big fight in your hands like uh, Mike had this morning to get your staff to be comfortable first, and then to get your patients to be comfortable to come back in and for them to know it's a safe environment. So, and I think it's gonna um, uh, take a lot of work, um, and I think your societies have come together to make sure that you know people are gonna have by then hopefully enough um, protective equipment to really uh, go around so the, the patient and the staff and yourself all feel protected. So um, I think I'm about at 12 minutes or so, so I will clam up and see what questions you guys have later on. Yeah, um, I didn't, uh, please uh, go into the chat box and ask your questions. Uh, I do have one question. It's, um, can you see grandchildren, you know, if you're not symptomatic? I mean. And you, I mean, I know you have grandchildren and, right. you know, so you have this issue as well. Can they sit on your lap? Do you, how close do you get to your grandchildren? What if you're asymptomatic? Yeah. So here's the deal. Um, uh, I'm not worried about your grandchildren. I'm worried about you. So uh, kids seem to get a very, very mild form of this, even though there have been um, uh, some cases that are horrible that you've heard about, I'm sure. But they can be asymptomatic carriers. So I would say if... Um, kids have been, um, and your grandkids have been sequestered for at least two weeks, and you know that there's not been a large interaction, I think it's highly unlikely at that point that they would be positive. Uh, but I would do what we do. I would do the same things. I would be uh, doing a, you know, at a distance, you know, your social distancing, you're washing your hands. I know masks are kind of freaky for some of the kids, but I would consider that unless you're really, I think, outside and you really can keep your proper distance. So we went um, with our kids and grandkids uh, for a walk in the woods uh, yesterday. Uh, by the way, in Easton, where it's legal, I wouldn't uh, trespass like Mike in uh, Fairfield. 
That's that's more. I'm more worried about you than in the kids in summary though. All right, thank you. Um, I have a couple of other questions here. Um, question from uh, Jeff Canales from Florida, as periodontist. Uh, he wants to know if the Danbury, uh, Connecticut situation is unique. You know, like wh like where do recovered patients go? I mean, yeah. you know, where, what happens or people who are recovering that can leave the hospital? What happens in Italy? What happened in China? What happened in other parts of the world? Yeah, this is absolutely crazy. So this is the this is uh, in flux now. We've been working on this for about 10 or 14 days. And quite frankly, we don't have a lot of progress. But I think what you're going to see is a lot of civic areas like this to recover. Um, we're also doing, by the way, with the medical staff. The medical staff doesn't want to go home to their families. So yes. uh, we've opened up a, a, a downtown a hotel for the folks. We actually have off uh, campus and on campus uh, housing at Yale. This is a terrible need uh, that people um, civically in your local communities have to think about in advance. And down in Florida with uh, you know, such an aging population, one nursing home gets infected and you've got, a, you've got a, a lot of folks that you've got to get out of there. So one of the suggestions is, is to start carving up um, independent of patient wishes into COVID and non-COVID um, uh, nursing homes and recovery areas. So as soon as somebody gets sick, they go to an area that only has COVID patients. This is a massive undertaking and it's really hard to do. And it, for us, it might, might require a state mandate and intervention. Okay, thank you. Um, a lot of questions there. Um, how safe is it once a patient has recovered from COVID to treat that patient? Are they now, are they still shedding the virus? I mean, when, I, mean I know they, they start shedding before they're symptomatic and they may shed for anywhere from seven to 14 days after that. I mean, can they shed after? Can they get the disease again? I know we have some reports of them getting them, but we don't know if those reports are actually true or not. Well, let me start at the end. Um, uh, the CDC is, is relatively confident, I'll say that, that the reports of people getting second infections are likely um, uh, not true, but it's, that's not 100%. But it is likely that you have immunity, you know, so much so that we're, you know, you, you've read about we're taking serum, doing the COVID convalescent antibodies and re-injecting them in folks. Yeah. So, um, are uh, people doing that? Yeah, we're doing that. We're doing those. Things. So those uh, um, normally would have taken a long time to get those approved, but the government has approved to speed these up as a kind of what we call open label studies. So actually the entire um, community in uh, uh, New Rochelle has uh, begun to donate all their blood. That was the right. first epicenter uh, around us. Um, so, but the, the, the million dollar question, which is a great one about when are we sure they aren't shedding? It seems that late in the disease, uh, they don't shed, but it also depends on the severity of the illness. So by that, I mean non-hospitalized patients usually take a couple of weeks to recover and are felt to be um, by the end of, you know, 14 uh, to maybe 18 days not to be shedding. However, if you had someone that was in the hospital who has been on a ventilator for a couple of weeks with severe illness, it may take them up to four to six weeks to recover. So I would say that once you're out of the hospital, I probably would not consider them totally COVID negative until another five or seven days to be on the safe side for you. Also a question about testing. You said it's about 30% false negative. What about false so, positives? So we're hoping, um, uh, first of all, we're hoping that the new tests that are coming out, these quicker, quick tests, which can amplify uh, the virus well, may decrease that to maybe only a five or 10% uh, miss rate. But the false positive rate is incredibly hard to um, come by because what you'd have to do is anybody that you didn't think had COVID, you'd have to test their antibodies to prove that they have this, the study. And right. that test, which is now becoming actually what I call a point of care test, is really not uh, available. So that number is really unknown, but I'm sure um, uh, at least a handful of unlucky few have been labeled as positive who probably didn't have it. Yeah, so there's going to be a now an antibody test that eventually will be available for us because some of us may have immunity we don't know it. Exactly. Right? So that's that's so we're looking in the hospital for that. We want to get the antibody test. We're hoping there's an X percentage of uh, healthcare workers that we can actually um, mm -hmm. feel comfortable about them being in the in the very COVID intense units that we have. Don't you think it would be make the most sense if we did a tremendous amount of testing so we can get an idea of the penetration of this virus? You know society 
This is the, the biggest oxymoron I've ever seen. Uh, um, even in, in Yale, uh, most of us want to test all the patients. Mm -hmm. They just allowed in Yale that we're going to test all the OB patients uh, that come in uh, to deliver their babies. Um, the bottom line is, is that we just don't have enough uh, tests. And if we uh, do all that, then we can't keep up with the patients. Yep. So I think we've got a couple of weeks until we get um, ubiquitous, really, really quick rapid turnover tests that you guys have been reading about that we can get the answer in 45 or 50 minutes by the time we run the test. So they're here, they're coming. But just to get to, you know, you heard one of the companies, if you're watching um, CNBC, that they can get 50,000 tests out a week. Abbott, the new test. That, yep. That's ridiculous. That's, that's barely enough for New York City. So we're just really behind the curve. Okay, so there's a lot of confusion out there. Uh, I don't know if you know the answer to this test. Uh, are KN95s as protective as N95? Yeah, I believe I do. I think when they've been looked at it, different countries and different systems have different ratings. Yep. Uh, but I've been told by our experts here that they really um, vary to a very, very minor degree from each other, and they're considered the highest level of protection. Only thing better is a gas mask. Okay, a um, lot of really useful information uh, and a lot of useful misinformation. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there that we, most of it's on TV. I mean, it's a great most opportunity. Of president. Well, it's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, it's a great opportunity to have you here and to have your expertise. You know, if, if you have the time, we'd like to probably bring you back again, maybe in a week or two, because this thing is you know, constantly changing. Because I mean, going back to work is going to be a, um, Big, a big deal for you know a lot a lot of us. I mean, we don't know when to bring go back to work. I'll be a conversation in about a month from now. Ray, did you want to add anything? Did you have any questions? Um, I just to follow up to uh, Stuart's earlier answer because I'm thinking you know for other complicated medical condition medical conditions, I do request medical clearance before patient come back to the office to be treated. You know, uh, hopefully in a week or two, maybe longer, we have the test more readily available to us. Is it realistic for dentists to request a medical clearance before they see the patient to be safe? That's interesting. I think a lot of local doctors, believe it or not, Ray, are about as confused as you guys are about uh, really what's going on and how to clear people. Um, so I think, um, I think we can do our best, likely guesstimating until we have the antibody test. I mean, once you know someone's positive with the antibodies, it's really highly, highly uh, unlikely. So we're gonna have to go through the medical phase, but actually I think the psychological healing phase might go on even longer. Mm -hmm. I think there's gonna be such paranoia. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how many people really are gonna even believe it and wanna come in, if you know what I mean, once you guys start uh, opening up and calling people in. Yeah. You know, we, we went through this before as dentists during the, the AIDS uh, crisis early on, uh, especially those people who were on from Florida will remember Dr. Acer, the dentist that had uh, a number of patients get AIDS in his office. They thought, it, they thought he had inoculated them himself. Uh, but who knows? We don't know. I have a lot more questions about masks. A lot of the answers we don't know. There's a lot of questions about the future. I don't want to want to go over that now. I'd like to go over what we can, what we do know. We don't know what the future is going to be. I don't know what our PP i.e. Uh, recommendations are going to be in the future. They are going to change. We'll probably have to have, you know, K95 masks of some sort. We're going to have to probably do something. Um, bottom line is we're human beings and we forget. And uh, all the crises that we've had in the past are over. You know, we had the AIDS crisis. We had 9-11 crisis. We had the Vietnam War crisis. We had the stock market crash of 2008. Go on and on and on. And after every crisis, one thing I've seen is we just bounce back because we're very resilient. So, um, the, Mike, can um, I add something real quick? I just, no. If you want, I sent Mike, the most important thing when you're seeing patients or if you have to see a high risk for emergency is the proper donning and doffing of your right. PPE. Uh, the biggest issue is taking it off. Right. And I've sent them some simple videos and stuff of really how you should do it, dispose yourself, wash your hands in between each steps, because that's when people get careless. They think they've been protected, and then they can they go ahead, and when they're taking off all the PPE that might have the droplets on it, that's when they infect themselves. So be really meticulous, especially with the doffing, the taking off of your uh, PPE. 
All right. Thank you, Stu. Uh, will you be on for a while? I'll, I'll stay on for you. Okay. Appreciate it. If you have to go, go. Um, we have two more speakers. Uh, the next one is my partner, Dr. Ma, uh, who is going to speak a little bit about um, he's been my go-to guy. Those of you who know me, I'm not a big detail guy, especially when it comes to numbers. I don't like looking at them. And he's been looking at the numbers are for the loans and paycheck protection and idle and, and everything else. So Ray, you want to, uh, want to share what you have learned and any suggestions you have? Because our mentors, we have two mentors in this area, Kane Waters, uh, which I'm sharing their information with everybody on this call, and Larry Rosen Associates. Um, between the two of them, they have about 4,000 dentists as clients, and oftentimes their information conflicts and it changes daily. So I will share all that information with you. Also, the donning and doffing video that Stu uh, graciously shared for me from Yale New Haven, I will send that to you all again. I sent it to everybody with the previous emails, but a lot of them go into spam, so please check your spam. So Ray, you, you want to chat a little bit about that? So just uh, to finish up the mask uh, conversation, I think a lot of people were asking about K K95. And I, I talked to, I have some friends and contacts in China. They, um, uh, since their uh, pandemic, you know, going on over there, there are a lot of like the mom and pop shops, you know, came on to, you know, try to make money basically. So I think what you're looking for, if you do want to buy online or through a contact, you want to make sure they are, um, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health certified. It's a branch of CDC. Um, some, some manufacturing is certified, some are not. If I were you, I should have stick with either FDA or you know, CDC approved uh, N95, just to be sure, because uh, you, don't, you don't know what you're getting if you're, there's no certification. And the FDA actually relaxed the rules saying if the mass is being shipped, to Europe have the European CE certification, you can use that too. I think that's just gonna, you know, uh, to address our shortage. But generally speaking, if you want to get online to make sure you check your credentials and make sure there's certification before you buy them, because you're using these to protect your patients. Uh, you're working on it actually matters a lot. Um, so that's for masks. Um, in terms of loans, I know uh, the federal government have two loans rolled out. You guys have a lot of you know, webinars and talking about different loans, the uh, idle loan, the economic injury, the disaster loan, and the, the paycheck protection program. Uh, the first one they roll out, they were hoping to use that, you know, quite a bit for our working capitals. Uh, however, there's some slowdown on that and they try to push the paycheck protection program uh, recently on Friday. I talked to my friends, you know, a lot of people are applying for that. There was a, a lot of chaotic things going on. Banks have system crashing. They can't really process all the loans. Uh, I mean, uh, my, my point is, I think, based on Kane Waters' uh, recommendation, which I was suspecting uh, anyway, was to apply to just kind of hold your spot. And they actually clarify with the three banks. One of them is, uh, I think, Bank of America, Live Oak Bank, and Key Bank. They told the uh, Kane Waters people that, that you can actually apply, get approved, and then choose the timing of a disbursement of the loan. Uh, basically, the eight weeks start ticking once you receive the money from the bank. Uh, those three banks, apparently, according to Water, made a promise they will let you choose one to disperse the loan. I think that's very important to us just because we're pretty much closed right now. Uh, ideally, in order to maximize the forgiven part, you want to use that right before you have the almost full staff capacity treating patients. Nobody. It's like start market, you can't really climb the bottom. I think we just kind of do the best we can. Um, at least I, I apply through Bank of America because I have an existing relationship with them. They always recommend the bigger banks first. Although uh, I've heard a smaller community banks have a faster processing rate uh, speed because they have less volume. Uh, but I went to Bank of America just because I have an existing relationship. The application probably took me five, maybe 10 minutes, it's very quick. Uh, at that point, they just want to you know, collect information and they reach out back to you. Uh, hopefully, there they won't, won't be much of a delay on that. Um, I think that's, that's basically my experience. The most important thing is really good to know that they will allow us to uh, time or uh, uh, want to use the money or get the money. That's my take. So what are your recommendations now? What should we, what should we do? Someone says, should I apply for the free check, uh, paycheck protection? Should I do that today? 
what if I'm a corporation? Should I apply to the corporation? Should I do it privately? What if we're partners? We they, it, they, you know? I think, well, as far as I know, again, I, I, you know, this is knowing as a dentist, uh, they actually recommend to apply for every legal entity you own. Right. Uh, so between my, Mike and you know, me and Mike, we both apply for a personal corporation. Um, I mean, at some point, I think we'll do it for our partnership. Um, and then delay the proceeds until uh, we have the staff coming back. Um, I applied. I think that's the thing to do because you, you know you can get exalted funds. Some that is actually apply for unemployment. If you have that going on, depending on how much money you're getting, you want to use that first and time time the PPP loan proceed later. You know uh, to stretch it out a little bit because it is a free money if you time it right. So it's all depending on where you go with this. Um, so I've, I've heard that the idle, which uh, if we get the idle money that'll come off of the, the pre-check for PPE loan. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think that's true. And I've also heard that there's no more money left for idle, so it's too late to apply. Although I went online today and there were still applications for it online. So again, more confusion with finances. So my, my, my take is just apply for everything. Um, I applied for unemployment because um, not working. I don't know if we're going to get anything, and they may be able to give us the you know six hundred dollars a week. We may we may get that as an aside. So between unemployment, I don't know what we qualify for a month. You know, Ray, as an, for unemployment. Uh, well, for mass for Connecticut, the maximum is six hundred forty nine individually, and uh, yeah. on top of that, to give you straight up six hundred dollars, you know, from federal government. That's about twelve hundred. So roughly, we're looking at probably five thousand or so a month. That turned to sixty thousand. Uh, you know, I still get asked questions about if what of my staff coming back. You know, that's a lot more money that some of my staff making. I'm gonna have a tough time. I, I, I'm not too worried about it. That's, you know, partially I think what you do is just connect with your staff on a weekly yeah. by a weekly basis. You know, make sure you're not forgetting about them, creating this culture for them to come back. And also remember the federal aid is six hundred dollars only gonna last July thirty first, which is not forever. So uh, yeah. at some point their pay or unemployment will get reduced pretty much uh, significantly compared to regular pay. So they, they will come back eventually. Okay. Um, I just got a um, I just got a uh, email from one of the doctors there that doesn't need the unemployment. Um, right. He, but, he, but he just received it for the past two weeks. So um, his partner is somebody that's very good with numbers like you, Ray. So they applied two weeks ago and his doctor is now getting unemployment. Um, if, you, if you don't want to identify yourself, you can text me how much you're getting a week and if you're getting the $600 as well uh, on that. I'd like to share that with the group. Uh, I, I other, go ahead. So I don't think anyone's getting the 600. I think the, at least last time, last night I checked the uh, Department of uh, Labor Connecticut, they have a huge backlog of processing. Ray, I just got it, $649 a week. Oh. Twice. So that's that's free money, right? Wait, that, that might be just a regular un uh, unemployment insurance. That unemployment, yeah. Right. So- um, The doctor it, uh, said, sent it to me privately, didn't send it to the group. Right. Uh, I mean, if you, if you apply it early, I think that's a smart thing to do. That's why some of the consultants ask, uh, you know, some of the practice to lay off their employee immediately so they can get an employment. Right now, the state has about quarter million applications, you know, um, more than normally they'll get for a year. Right. Uh, they process about 90,000 so far, you know, doubling their employees to process everything and they have about five weeks of backlog. Uh, I, I just got a text from my employee, this assistant this morning asking about the status. There's not much we need to do. Um, uh, they just have to wait as there's a huge backlog with, uh, with an employment at this point. All right, great. I have a few more questions, but I think we're going to turn it over. Let's bring it, let's introduce Gary Phelan. Um, Gary, welcome. Um, uh, good morning, Mike. Okay. So let me just introduce you, Gary, because uh, a lot of people don't know you. Um, Gary is a lawyer um, and he is an employment lawyer. He works with, he does a lot uh, with disability in the workplace, with staff responsibilities, with family responsibilities, with discriminations. He's one of the, he's voted one of the top lawyers in, in America, the de designated lawyers a year. And he's a local guy too. He's got practice in, in, in Stratford 
and uh, one in um, Westport. Uh, he's a professor. He teaches at Quinnipiac University. Uh, he serves as commentator on TV for Employment Law, and on Good Morning America, CNN, NBC Nightly News, CBS This Morning, CBS News, News, Fox News, Court TV. You ever been on the important one? You missed one there. Have you ever been on Dr. Oz, though? I know. I, I know that's Dr. Phil, but not Dr. Oz. Dr. Phil? Yeah, yes. For, for, for different reasons. Yes. Well, so I've asked Gary to, to join us because, you know, we're dentists, and all I'm doing is talking to dentists about money. This is one thing that I've, I found out. Most dentists don't know anything about money. There's a group of investors that Stu turned me on to, because Stu's a big investor, that follow what dentists and physicians do with their money, and they do the complete opposite, and they're doing really well on their investments. So we, one thing, you know, we've been on these blogs for the last two or three weeks, and what I've found is it changes every day. So we don't know anything. Not that people who invest know anything either, but I don't know. But with that said, Gary, we're going to turn it over to you. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about what we can expect in the workplace when we return, what our responsibilities to our employees, what our responsibilities to our employees if they don't want to come to work. What if they're home and they're making $600 a week? You know, they're getting that from the government and they're getting their unemployment check of, let's say, another $350, $400 a week. Maybe they're making $1,000 a week. That may be more than they make at work. And they say, I don't want to come back to work because on unemployment, I seem to be doing better. But that may be a problem that some of us uh, face. And if you want to talk a little bit about the, um, the loans, feel free to chime in on that because I'm sure you know as much as anybody on this phone call. So, Gary, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mike. And, and um, thank you for inviting me to speak this morning. You're welcome. You know, when, I, when I was preparing, I was um, uh, read in the, an interview with Larry David. Uh, who you may know as the um, actor in Curb Your Enthusiasm, and he was asked this week in a New York Times interview, uh, what are the things he fears most about the pandemic? Uh, he said two things, anarchy and an emergency dental procedure, um, and not necessarily in that order. So um, uh, all of you are, you may, you know, you, you definitely are all essential. And um, I'm hoping something I say today will be, will be helpful. Let's, let's get started with the unemployment because I think that's the most urgent matter that is affecting all of your uh, employees as well as yourselves. And I, that's one of the things I was going to suggest is that you all file for unemployment because it is, um, you know, it's something that you are being affected by the layoff. You are, it sounds like many of you right at the present time are unemployed. Uh, and so you should definitely file for unemployment. There is a, uh, I'm gonna just hold it up, but Connecticut Department of Labor has a uh, question and answer. This, this is what it looks like. If you, go to the, um, uh, if you go to the Department of Labor's website, it's frequently asked questions about coronavirus for workers and employers. They've been updating that almost every day. Uh, and it's something, and I will send out the link uh, you know, to Mike when we get done, but, you know, I think that's something that's, that's very helpful. Let's go over just some of the, um, you know, some of the basics of unemployment. You have, you know, for your employees, the separation package is on the, um, you know, it is on the website, the link to it, but also um, if you file it yourself, you can file it. It's, uh, you know, www.filectui.com. What's important to have is the registration number, you know, for the employer registration number and a date of return. Now, some of the questions we've been getting is, well, you know, we, we think we know we're closed through, you know, April 22nd, but we don't know when we're going to return. It's more important to expedite the processing just to have a return date. I exchanged emails last night with a, an attorney from the Connecticut Department of Labor, uh, and she said, what if that that so presumably that, that date is going to change. You're, you're likely not gonna be returning April 22nd. They will provide guidance, which I, I'm happy to forward to Mike that he can forward to all of you as to how they're gonna uh, enable employees to continue to get the benefits beyond April 22nd. Now, the, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a percentage of your income up and with the limitation of $649. Uh, there's a lot, you know, on this website, really, it has a, you know, on the, the Q&A has a lot of helpful information. I'd encourage you all to read it. Now, one of the, the questions, because we were Ray was talking about the $600 uh, 
you know, through the federal, through the CARES Act. There's an, an uh, at least right now, there's not a definitive answer of whether or not if somebody is unemployed after uh, the date of March 29th, are they entitled to the $600 per week in unemployment benefits? The Connecticut Department of Labor is waiting for guidance from the, the U.S. Department of Labor. I think they will be covered, um, whether it's you, you know you or your staff, you know, because in theory, unemployment is something you file for every week. So even though the CARES Act, you know, provisions don't go into effect until March 29th, I think it's going to go, you know, if, if you are filing after March 29th, that, that you will be covered. Um, that's what most people are thinking is going to be uh, the result. And again, as Ray pointed out, those benefits are going to uh, expire as of July 31st. Now, Mike raised the question, you know, if you, if you look at somebody, you know, depending on what their income is, they, they may be making over $1,000 between the federal benefits and the state benefits. What happens if when ideally you open, you know, at some point in say May um, at best, or maybe even June, you say, say to people, okay, okay, now we'd like you to return. And they say, you know, we're fearful, we, we're scared. We don't, uh, we won't, don't want to go back to work. Um, there's an article in the, um, on Saturday's, uh, uh, the, the Hearst newspapers, the Connecticut Post, Norwalk Hour, you know, where I was interviewed uh, on, on that question because what the Connecticut Department of Labor guidance they provided on Friday was if, you know, it, it depends on why somebody doesn't return to work. If it's just fear of contracting the virus, that's not going to be good cause um, where, where they're entitled to continue to get unemployment. Now, one of the things that sometimes employers will do you know, with respect to unemployment is just not challenge it. But under the guidance through the Connecticut Department of Labor, they are saying if somebody is not willing to return to work due to fear of the virus, you know, that, that um, uh, there, because where there's no medical reason, uh, that the employer has to challenge that claim for um, unemployment. Now, if the person has an underlying autoimmune disease, or if, if say they're over 65, um, there may be reasons why they might be able to, to challenge it, but again, the employer's in the position of having to challenge. It's very rare that they use the word must in their guidance, but here they're saying that, that the employer must challenge. Another thing that isn't, you know, when thinking about returning because, you know, because of the fear, you might not have the patient demand, particularly initially. One of the things that you know, I think all employers should be thinking about is, is in Connecticut is what's called shared work. If you, you know, rather than terminating people, um, you know, because you may have choices where you have to get rid of uh, or terminate some people and keep others on, another alternative is to, to pursue uh, the shared work alternative, where let's say you have 40% less patient demand. So you're going to only have 60% percent, um, you know, for, for employee demand is you, you pay, you reduce the hours to 60 percent, pay them for the 60 percent, and then they can continue to get unemployment for the 40 per 40 percent of their time. Um, that's somewhat, sometimes better than just terminating people. Another issue is going to be if you do return and you don't have a full staff, you're going to have to make hard choices. Who do you keep? Who do you, who do you not keep? And you, employers shouldn't just assume, well, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll um, uh, you know, because it's a business-related reason, clearly COVID is a business-related reason, that I'm immune from any sort of claims if I, if I just tell some people not to return. That's an employment action. You have to be very, very careful as to who you don't ask back and why you're not asking back. I always think, as someone who represents both employers and employees, candor, this is a time where candor is better. If you don't want to hurt someone's feelings, that could come up back to, to haunt you because then the employee may say, you know, it's due to uh, the, you know, age, race, sex, disability, national origin, um, those sort that that was the reason. It wasn't because of the reason you claimed. So those are the hard choices down the road that ideally you're going to be faced with those pretty soon. Um, another, um, uh, the, the second employment matter that to, to address, and I'll try to do it um, quick, relatively quickly, is 
you know, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, that pa passed March 17th. Um, and that relates to extending FMLA leave uh, to, to individuals that uh, may be out for, you know, certain reasons that I'll discuss in a moment. Um, FMLA is generally doesn't cover most of your practices because you have more or you have less than 50 employees, but under the, the, the Families First legislation, it isn't list, limited to just 50 or more employees, it's really any employer. And so there is a, um, uh, just the, there's two, two parts. One is if an employee is unable to work because either a quarantine or they've been advised to self-quarantine or they're experiencing symptoms of, of COVID, they may be entitled to up to 12 weeks of FMLA leave that the employer has to pay. Um, the first two weeks are unpaid. They can use, you know, if they have PTO, you know, paid time off, they can use that time. And then after two weeks, they can recover up to $511 per day at the regular rate of pay. And again, that's someone, um, that, that's if it's necessary. For most people, they're not going to obviously require 12 weeks. The second um, is, is, and the, more, the thing I think is much more common, is if somebody is not able to work because because um, either they're caring for an individual uh, who is subject to quarantine or an isolation order, or if they're caring for a son or daughter whose school is closed. That's the one that I think is, is, is the most common because chances are their schools will be closed uh, through the end of the, the school year, you know, certainly through June. And so for those individuals, they are entitled to, again, up to 12 weeks off. Um, under FMLA, the first 10 are unpaid, same thing, you can use your, any PTO time. But, the, and then as far as the uh, remainder of the time, the employee is up to, is entitled up to two thirds of their rate, uh, limited to $200 per day. Now there's two things that, three things that are really important about that. And, then, and the first thing, as far as, there's a lot of questions about this. To give you an idea, there's Thursday night, uh, 124 pages of, of guidance came out from the Department of Labor. And now there's a, you know, 79 questions and answers. So there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of issue, employment issues surrounding those. Uh, the one thing that's clear is you have to post, you're gonna have to post a notice. This is the, you know, the, the one page form. I will forward it to Mike, you can post it. You know, the, the law is just, you have to post it in a conspicuous place. It used to be, you know, people would post it in the, you know, in their, um, you know, in their break room. Um, but now what is, you know, most people are going to be providing it online uh, by email or, and, and so one sort of group email, I think is the best, the best way to communicate that. The second thing is that the American Dental Association, uh, there's an exemption for healthcare providers. The American Dental Association advocated for saying that the association was a healthcare provider and would be exempt under this. Under the guidelines that just came out, there's no exception uh, for um, dental offices, so it's likely you're going to be covered. Third, and perhaps most important reason to all of you, is that this law applies to people who are terminated after April 1. So if they're terminated before um, or they were laid off, it may not apply to you at all. It will only apply if and when you're the uh, employees return. The, um, uh, the last thing is just really overall advice with respect to employees because some employers are asking us, what should we do now? You know, our, our employees are laid off. I think one of the most important things is, is I mean, you can provide them with, with the links to unemployment, you know, but this is, you know, it does not cost anything to make a phone call. You can keep in touch with your employees, and I think it's important to do so. Having represented, you know, employees, you know, sometimes I, I always hear from uh, clients, you know, they didn't even call us when we were sick, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to keep in touch with them, uh, not to be overly optimistic. You know, you want to keep them motivated, uh, but at the same time, really avoid making promises. For example, if you say, you know, we're going to reopen by a certain date. Um, or just assurances of reopening, you don't know right now. And, you know, you don't want to be in a situation of, you know, um, where somebody says down the road, you know what, I had another employment opportunity, but you assured us we'd be returning. 
And so, you know, be, be wary about that, but almost like take the approach that parents are being given under this process is first, you got to take care of yourself. Um, you know, the, the mask on the airplane, you know, you first put the mask on yourself. But I think it's important to, um, again, to keep in touch with people, be optimistic, I, w without, while also being realistic and tell the truth. That's the most important thing I think employers can do right now. All right, well, thank Gary, thank you. Uh, that was a really good overview of a lot of information a lot of us don't think about. Um, and Gary's, uh, you're, you're available for consultation, for conversations, if they want to email you. He has a very voluminous website. Uh, that was on your link. I'll send it out to you all again. Um, I'll send you the information that you sent to me. Um, I'll send out the video that Stu sent to me about donning and doffing. And I'll send the link to Kane Waters' website uh, where they have basically a uh, video conference every other day. And there's a tremendous amount of information. Um, and Ray, is there anything else that I want to uh, save out, send out there? Um, no, I have a question regarding the, the, the family uh, medical leave actually for Gary. What if during the furlough period, you know, uh, are you going to be on the hook for any of that? Wait, pardon, uh, Ray. If, if employees are furloughed right now and then uh, you send a post out and uh, they have you know, certain conditions fall into the five, uh, five categories uh, on, the, on the Family uh, and the Medical Leave Act. Uh, are you responsible to start paying them right now, even though no. they're furloughed? No, because again, the, the, um, that provision does, it, it would have to be something, the, the legislation became effective April 1. So they have to have been um, working, not just employed, because again, these are still employees, but they have to have been working on or after April 1. So uh, they're, if they're on fur furloughed, it doesn't affect them right now. Okay. Um, I got a question. Someone's asked us about submitting a new UI application every week. I've never filled out. Does anyone know what a UI application is? Sure. Yeah, it's a, the unemployment application. Again, you don't have to um, you know, to, to, to fill out every, every week. And the, you know, the important thing is to have, a, if you're fur, for employees are furloughed, to have a return to work date, even though that might end up getting extended, just to have a return to work date, because that's what, uh, you know, the Department of Labor is advised, will, had said will expedite the process, and it's already gonna be long enough. I mean, the estimated now, wait now is five weeks. Okay. Um, I did get a, a private text from one of the uh, participants that not only has gotten unemployment, but his um, PPA loan has been approved and he can take it whenever he wants to. So I think Ray and I, where we are now, Ray, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're just applying for everything now and we'll let the chips fall where they may. You know, we just want to get in line because we don't know how long we're going to be out of work and if the money's still going to be available in such a long line. Um, I. Some of you, uh, Eric Klein, I just want to congratulate you on figuring out how to raise your hand. You're the only one on this call out of 75 people was done that, so it's impressive. And uh, I don't know if you want to share with the group what you share with me, but I, I look forward to your question. Uh, sure. Hi, everybody. We'll get through this. Um, I had a question about teledentistry. There's a lot of um, promotion of teledentistry now and, and webinars and stuff. But the ADA last week said that we are not allowed to practice teledentistry as of, I believe it was last week, and they were going to research whether or not we can practice in such way. I know there's codes. Um, any, any knowledge about teledentistry, and even if it's practical? I've had a few patients send me photos of broken teeth, and you know I've texted them what to do. Um, but there's every day I get, you know, someone asking me to join a webinar about teledentistry. Is it legal? I don't have any information on that. Is anybody else? You can either send a chat or raise a hand. Gary? I don't know. All right. All right. Uh, Stu, you want to unmute yourself? Stu, you're... I got you are muted. You mute. You did it to yourself. Well, then it said you did. Don't be. Come on. 
So I can tell you one thing. Uh, so the uh, AMA um, and uh, governmental agencies have rapidly um, uh, fast-tracked, at least temporarily, what we're allowed to do in, for telemedicine. I think it's a great question because you can do a lot, you know, talking to po folks, looking at the pics. So they've actually um, allowed us to do a whole bunch of different bill billing. So we have phone billing. We have, um, you know, uh, telehealth. They've actually also relaxed the HIPAA laws. So you can actually do it with FaceTime and stuff like this um, because it's an emergency. So we're all doing it in, in um, you know, four. So I think uh, in these kind of times, it's, it would not be unreasonable for future societies uh, to, you know, get something going very quickly in the interim so you can like, keep in touch with, you know, the modest percentage of patients that might need your help. Yeah, there are, there are now three or four, I don't know if they're HIPAA compliant or now, there are now three or four dental telemedicine applications that I've uh, been asked to join. I have done nothing with it uh, thus far. Um, uh, Jay Dworkin uh, has some guidance he's going to submit to me. I'll send that out with you. What bank, Jay, did you use? I think that would be important if you can do that, uh, and how you've been affected about getting paid. Um, any other questions? Right now, you can either raise your hand or send a chat. You've been pretty good about sending, working in a chat. All right, there's a question coming up here, because if not, we'll close this out. Uh, final final unemployment, a doctor can trigger an audit. Someone asked, asked that question. Uh, Gary, you're probably the one for that. Can filing unemployment trigger an audit? Well, I, you know, in theory, yes. But right now, um, you know, the Department of Labor is, is just really swamped. Uh, I don't think that's going to be their priority right now, realistically. I don't think filing, just filing for unemployment in itself triggers an audit. Yeah. Unless, unless you're putting in for 100,000, you put away four or 500,000 in, in your retirement plan, that might, that might trigger an audit. Um, okay, employee responsibility. What's, uh, Gary, what's our employee responsibility for, uh, you can read these two, Gary, they're in your chat box, uh, for paid sick leave and emergency family and medical leave act. Um, and also what happens if someone loses uh, child care and they have to care for their child, do they still have to be paid? You know, th those type, what are our responsibilities? Okay, well, th the first thing, yes, those are, those are individuals also losing child care. That would be uh, an example of where your responsibility would be to cover the person as far as FMLA leave up right. to 12 weeks. First two weeks is unpaid. They can use PTO time. And then from, for the, the next 10 weeks, they can uh, claim up, up to two thirds of their salary capped at $200 a day. Again, employers are going to get a, you know, a tax credit. That's how, in effect, the government is saying you're, you're essentially going to be reimbursed for that. Obviously not in the short term, um, but that's how that's being paid for. Okay. All right. Well, I wanted to keep this to an hour. I want to keep people on. We get a lot of these things coming in. I want to thank everybody for your time. If you'd like me to bring Gary back, um, and if you would like me to bring Dr. Zarge back, if I can get them both to come back, I think they would both add a tremendous amount of value to this uh, presentation. Ray, thank you for your insight, for doing all the background paperwork. Um, and he's Ray's done a phenomenal job organizing a lot of this because it's not my my wheelhouse for sure. Um, my wheelhouse is more like, what do we do? You know, what do we? So what do we do now? We got we got all this bad news, and uh, you know, I I listen to a lot of visionaries uh, who who think that the world is always going to be better. I'm one of them as well. Um, I mean, it could have been a lot worse, as Stu said. I mean, Ebola knocks out maybe 90 percent. SARS was 11 uh, percent. Um, you know, MRSA, MERS was, was a higher, higher percentage. We had, we had the stock market, which was lower than it was back in 2008 than it is today. There's usually a lot of compelling opportunities ahead. I mean, almost everything, Purell, the thing that we wash our hands with, wouldn't be around if it wasn't for AIDS. I mean, that was a, that was a big opportunity for somebody. We have now Airbnb, we have Uber, uh, we have Uber Eats, we have Groupon, Slack, what's up? Most of these changes have occurred because of digitalization. And we now have an opportunity to digitize more. We've done it in our office. Since Ray's joined us, we, I used to have a paper charge. We're now completely digital. 
we're doing everything digitally in the office. We're now doing digital dentistry. We're scanning patients. We're now taking impressions. And right now, we're now doing digital meetings. I did not know how to use a Zoom app until about seven or eight days ago, like the first time I ever did it. Uh, I had Alan Farber, who's a member of our study club, used to set up all the Zoom apps for our study club because nobody knew how to do it except for Alan. I think that this is something that's going to be a great opportunity for us to do more in line meetings. We're also going to be able, we're definitely going to be doing teledentistry of some part in the future. And if you're not digitized yet, now's the time to do that. This is the opportunity to go ahead and now to reinvent your business. And digitization will disrupt everything. This virus has been disruptive, but from this disruption will come an opportunity. And the opportunity is going to be how can we make our, our, our practices more bullet, bulletproof. I don't think we'll have a virus that hits us this hard again so quickly because we're now learning so much from this virus. So we're going to learn a lot as human beings, as scientists, doctors, dentists. A lot of information is going to come out of this, and we're going to all benefit from it. Try to stay away from watching too much news, you know. Uh, try not to watch much at all. I got a, an email from one of my employees who is usually not the most upbeat. She says, you know, I was in a good mood as long as I don't watch the news. My husband turns on. I've never exercised. And now she's going out taking a walk. And she feels very positive about it. So the four, the four food groups that I always talk about are sleep, diet, exercise, and mindfulness. Those are very important. We've given another gift right now, and that's the gift of time. And during that time, we can spend more time with our families. I know I'm spending more time with my family. Very few other people want to spend any time with me. And it's been fun. I'm cooking more. I've never cooked a whole fish before. I know how to do that. If you want to quit smoking, now's a good time. If you're vaping, now's a good time to vape. I know we're all doctors on this call, dentists, but uh, I know there are probably some smokers and vapors here. So it may be a good opportunity to change some of your habits. And like anything else that bad has happened in our lives, it will pass. You know, we talk about the curve flattening out, the anxiety curve, which goes up and up and up, always flattens out. It's going to get better and we'll get stronger from it. And so I want to thank you for taking some time uh, for sharing today. I always learn something. I learned a lot of things today. I didn't realize that people were getting unemployment already. I didn't understand about all the numbers. I mean, Gary, you, you were very enlightening. Thank you for that. Still, you're always enlightening. And... Um, I will make available this uh, video to you all. I'll send that out either today or tomorrow. I'll try to get Jose to download this. And I'll send you um, the blogs from Kane Waters, from Peter Diamandis, as well as from Bradley Bale and Doni, and it gives us some suggestions of what to do for your time. If you want to have another one of these, we don't have one planned right now. Um, but uh, Ray and I will be happy to put one on either next week or maybe in two weeks from now. But we thought a week might have been too soon, but a lot has happened this last week, and I'm sure or not it's going to happen next week. So we'll let you all know. So thank you, and feel free to just send me an email or, or chat right now within the next few minutes, and I will address uh, all of your concerns. I'm going to mute everybody right now, so some people maybe want to stay on here and chat uh, to us a little bit. Uh, let me unmute you all. Okay, see, my IT guy is not right here right now. So, Ray, where's the unmute button for everybody? Okay, found it. Okay, thank you for having me on. We're, uh, it's now open. It's also, just as a side, somebody may not look great early in the morning. It's nice to see everybody at the same time. Thank you. But it doesn't look oh, like. You're all unmuted, so you, uh, if you say anything, we're all going to hear you. This one? What's the current chatter with the idol and the PPP that the ADA sent out something along with the aid? Ray, you want to Ray, Ray, raise the expert on that? Ray's muted. Hey, you're muted. You're muted, Ray. Um, so not an expert, but I've heard you can't take both loans uh, at the same time. Uh, if you took the idle loan before, you can actually refinance it, part of it, to the PPP loan. But uh, I think at this point, they don't they, you can't take both loans. I applied. I applied both loans. I, I didn't even hear anything back from idle loan. So for the time, if you guess me, I'm probably not going to take it because the PPP loan will be more available and it's more free money in there. Right. Yeah. The, uh, in the application of the, the PPP, there was a sentence that asked specifically 
Yeah. Have you received funds with any disaster loan by April 3rd? I'm just sitting here answered, looking at a webinar. If you answered yes, then you may not be eligible webinars for Webinars when you get a bunch of people on the computer, several people, and they talk about certain things and you get educated. Hey, Dave, we just muted you for that one. <laughs> well, Dave's almost my age, so you got to get by hand. You know where I am? By hand. I do not. I remember. I would mute everybody and just have the two people. So, Mark, you were saying I didn't get your question. Then. Yeah, according when I filled out the PPP, there was a specific question that said, "Have you received any loans, any disaster loans?" by April 3rd. Now I applied for the IDA loan the week before, but I didn't receive it in the three business days that they said. And I didn't receive it by April 3rd, so I said no. And that's the correct answer. But over the weekend, the ADA sent out a notice along with the AAP that we had to you know, fill the petition out again, because they were saying now within the same CARES Act, there's wording that says, Yes, you can. And there's another one that says, no, you can't apply for both loans. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, we we'll have to get more guidance on this, you know, from, from the federal government. Uh, applying itself is not, not going to stop you from getting the PPP loan. I mean, personally, I favor a PPP loan better just for the sake of free, more free money in there. But it's all depending on your working capital, you know, how much money you need. I mean, all, 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 along, all along, they said that they would bridge the two loans anyway. At least that's right. what the ADA originally said in its first one. Right, but there, there, there's uh, the law and there's interpretation of the law. So uh, it, it's a tough one over there. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Well, great seeing you all. I'm leaving. I'm going to work on my website. Dave Humphrey, good to see you, man. Yeah, good to see you, too. Nice, nice to see you. I like, the, I like the new look, Dave. You look good, too. Good to see everybody. Yeah. Okay, Gary, Gary, thank you so much for staying on. Gary, if you want to send me anything, I will send it out with the email to everybody. Okay. Uh, great resource. I really appreciate uh, spending time with us. Happy to help in the future, too. Okay. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks.